support all families. We want everyone to be safe at home, in school, at work, and in public spaces. Minnesota is a really strong state, but we know it can be even better. And that economic prosperity hasn't reached all families in all corners of the state. At the Capitol, our work will focus on improving economic prosperity for all families across the state. We're going to work very hard to ensure world-class educational opportunities, more affordable, more accessible health care, um, and investing in Minnesota's critical infrastructure from clean energy to transportation to broadband. Following the DFL press conference, members of the new House Republican Caucus gave their reaction to the DFL agenda. It was very clear uh, that the Democrats believe that that's not enough. Government needs to get much, 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 much bigger, according to them. Uh, we have another idea. Our, gov our idea is instead of growing government, uh, taking money from hardworking Minnesotans and forcing them to flee our state like they have been, uh, we actually shrink the size of government. Instead of making government bigger and people smaller, we bring government to be smaller and allow people and their families to be bigger again. On Tuesday, the Minnesota House of Representatives officially kicked off the 2019 legislative session. With one representative absent, 133 members received the oath of office, and Representative Melissa Hortman was sworn in as the new Speaker of the House. Steve Swiggum was the first Speaker I served under, and I thought he did a really good job of showing us that the Speaker is the Speaker of the Minnesota House, not the Speaker of the DFL House or the Speaker of the Republican House, but the Speaker of the Minnesota House. The campaign is over, it's time to take off the blue jerseys and the red jerseys, and it's our job to govern here together as Team Minnesota. In what is typically a ceremonial opening day floor session, a lively debate on temporary House rules broke out. After House Majority Leader Ryan Winkler proposed temporary rules intended to streamline the legislative process through changes in the House's committee structure, House Minority Leader Kurt Doubt unsuccessfully proposed an amendment that would have prevented those changes. Ultimately, the House voted 74 to 59 against the Doubt Amendment and adopted the temporary rules by the same margin. For a recap of the opening day events and the House DFL leadership press briefing, check out our session daily coverage on the House website, www.house.mn slash session daily. We are moments away from the start of today's House floor session. Following adjournment, the House is expected to have a short memorialization for former House member Tom Rukavina, who passed away on January 7th. We now go to the House floor for the start of today's House floor session. The House will come to order. Prayer by the Chaplain. As I was forming my thoughts for this uh, prayer this morning and the honor and the privilege that it is, I was wondering what it is you as representatives and I as a pastor might share in common, and it's the call for the welfare of all people. And with this in mind, I would just like to start with this verse from Isaiah, learn to do good, 
seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Let us pray. Lord God in heaven, pour down your grace on this House of Representatives so they may faithfully fulfill their duties. Bless them and empower them to work for the security, benefit, and protection of all the people. May they work together for the common good, seek justice, promote peace, reconcile those divided, stamp out oppression, reduce hate and fear, and live personal lives of honesty and integrity. May they make the great state of Minnesota a model for the entire nation of honest, transparent, effective governance. May all this that is done this day be for the good of all people. Amen. The chaplain for today is the Reverend John Stratton from St. Andrew's Lutheran Church, Matamidi, Minnesota. Pledge of Allegiance. Please remain standing and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Will Representative-elect Robert Bierman from District 57A please come forward to take the oath of office. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Minnesota and that you will faithfully discharge the duties of the office to which you have just been elected to the best of your ability, so help you God. Thank you. Congratulations. Members, please join me in congratulating Robert Bierman. The clerk will take the roll.
The clerk will close the roll. A quorum is present. The clerk will read the journal of the preceding day. Journal of the House, 91st Session, 2019, first day, St. Paul, Minnesota, Tuesday, January 8th, 2019. If there is no objection, further reading of the journal will be dispensed with, and the journal will be approved as corrected by the chief clerk. Hearing no objection, the journal is approved as corrected by the chief clerk. Introduction of House Files. The following House Files have been offered for introduction today. The Chief Clerk will report the House Files and give them their first reading. Introduction of first reading of House Files 1 through 31. First reading, House Files 1 through 31. Messages from the Senate. Message from the Senate, Madam Speaker. I hereby announce the adoption by the Senate of the following Senate concurrent resolution herewith transmitted. Senate concurrent resolution number one, a Senate concurrent resolution relating to the adoption of temporary rules. Winkler moves that the rules be so far suspended that the Senate concurrent resolution number one be now considered and be placed upon its adoption. I call upon the member from Hennepin, Representative Winkler, to explain the motion. Uh, Madam Speaker and members, this is a motion to suspend the rules so that we can adopt a uh, concurrent resolution with the Senate to adopt temporary rules uh, that will guide us uh, in our work with the Senate, and we will be using the rules of the Senate from the preceding uh, session. The member from Isanti, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd ask <laughs> members to support the motion. Is there any discussion to the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. A <clears throat> message from the Senate, Madam Speaker, I hereby announce the adoption by the Senate of the following Senate concurrent resolution herewith transmitted. What? Senate concurrent resolution number two, a Senate concurrent resolution relating to parking space in the capital area for members of the legislature and staff. So members, there was a little confusion about what the vote on that last, uh, that last issue was. So um, if uh, Representative Winkler would move to reconsider the last vote, we'll rewind a little bit, we'll go a little bit slower, explain to folks what's happening. Madam Speaker, I move to re uh, reconsider the preceding question. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. We're at the um, item of business that Representative Winkler raised and Representative Doubt spoke to, which is a motion to suspend the rules. So the first vote will be on suspension of the rules. The second vote will be on the resolution itself. To the suspension of the rules, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails, the rules are suspended. To the motion on the resolution, Representative Winkler, Resolution 1. Madam Speaker, members, as I stated, this is to adopt temporary joint rules with the Senate based on the preceding joint rules of the House and Senate. And I would urge adoption. Any discussion? Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd ask members to support the resolution. On the resolution, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The resolution is adopted. Message from the Senate. Madam Speaker, I hereby announce the adoption by the Senate of the following Senate concurrent resolution herewith transmitted. Senate concurrent resolution number two, a Senate concurrent resolution relating to parking space in the capital area for members of the legislature and staff. Winkler moves that the rules be so far suspended that Senate concurrent resolution number two be now considered and placed upon its adoption. The member from Hennepin, Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, this is the motion to suspend the rules for the second concurrent resolution. Thank you, Representative Winkler. Uh, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd ask members to support the motion. Any discussion? On the suspension of the rules to take up Senate concurrent resolution number two, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. 
The motion prevails. The rules are suspended. Winkler moves that Senate Concurrent Resolution Number 2 be now adopted. To the resolution, Representative Winkler. Uh, Madam Speaker, members, this is another housekeeping amendment related to parking. It's similar to the desks motion we had on the first day. I'm not sure we have why we have to do it, but we have to do it. The member for my sanity, Representative Dowd. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd ask members to support the resolution. On the resolution, seeing no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The resolution is adopted. A message from the Senate, Madam Speaker. I hereby announce the adoption by the Senate of the following Senate concurrent resolution herewith transmitted. Senate concurrent resolution number three, a Senate concurrent resolution relating to adjournment for more than three days. Winkler I moves that the rules be so far suspended that Senate concurrent resolution number three be now considered and be placed upon its adoption. I call on the member from Hennepin, Representative Winkler, to explain the motion to suspend the rules. Madam Speaker, I move that we suspend the rules to take up Senate concurrent resolution number three. The member from Isanti, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd ask members to support the motion. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion to suspend the rules, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The rules are suspended. Winkler moves that Senate concurrent resolution number three be now adopted. To the resolution, Representative Winkler. Uh, Madam Speaker, members, this resolution is to recognize the Martin Luther King Day holiday and to allow the House and Senate to be in adjournment for more than three days. The member from Isanti, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd ask members to support the motion. On the motion, seeing no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The resolution is adopted. Announcements. The member from Hennepin, Representative Winkler. Uh, Madam Speaker and members, just to uh, clarify, so we've had uh, training this morning, we have further training this afternoon. As After we adjourn session today, however, here on the floor we will be uh, taking up remembrances of former Representative Tom Rukavina. And so we will adjourn and the Speaker will immediately uh, call us, not back into session, but will reconvene us uh, informally. Uh, the the um, uh, remembrance will be uh, televised and available on the House website and uh, the Rukavina family has been informed that we are going to be doing this today. Uh, and as a uh, sign of uh, uh, respect and to uh, capture a little bit of Tom Rukavina, we are passing out buttons with his uh, picture on it. And so members are free to take them or use them as they wish. Any further announcements? Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, I move that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 3.30 p.m. Monday, January 14, 2019. Representative Winkler moves that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 3.30 p.m. Monday, January 14, 2019. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, I move that the House be now adjourned. Representative Winkler moves that the House do now adjourn. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The House is adjourned. Members will reconvene right away in our informal session to remember Tom Rukavina. And I'll wait for a few minutes for folks to get settled. Anyone who had the chance to serve with Tom Rukavina was uh, exposed to a special treat, a true original of a human being. And um, I was asked to share my favorite remembrance of Tommy Rukavina. And I have to say it was, well, he was, it's partisan, but that's, that's who Tommy was. Um, I would sometimes get frustrated with uh, members of our own party and, and um, Hopefully nobody takes offense at this. This is a Tommyism. He would say, 
the worst Democrat is better than the best Republican. But that's Tommy, right? And you could hear that and you would laugh about it. And I will never forget the time he was uh, sitting in the seat that uh, Robert Bierman occupies and he was giving a very fiery speech. And he was taking Speaker Steve Swigum to task uh, relentlessly. And Steve Swigum was pretty frustrated. I think uh, Representative Erickson remembers this. And uh, Ron Abrams was one of the speakers pro tem and he was sitting in the front and he motioned to Ron Abrams, come on up here. Like, I'm getting down there. I'm getting in the fray. And what Representative Swigum had to respond to was that Tommy Rukavina, during his speech, had called the speaker a snake. And so when Representative Swigum held Tommy to task for calling him a snake during the House debate, Tommy said, Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry. I thought I just thought that. I didn't realize I said it out loud. <laughs> Next, I would like to recognize Rob Eklund. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I've got lots of stories, but I think I'll share the first time I met Tom Rukavina. It was about 25 years ago. I was testifying at a field hearing that Congresswoman Helen Chenoweth is having on a proposal to uh, take 40,000 acres of prime aspen and put it into the Boundary Waters. Well. You guys know me. I couldn't let that one go. So I was down there testifying against it. And first off, a little disclaimer, the only thing that I, pretty much the only thing I didn't agree with Paul Wellstone on was logging and mining. So anyway, so then there's part of the story here. So as I'm testifying, then I got up and I said, and our ultra-liberal senator from the Twin Cities who knows nothing about Aspen is making this proposal. And then I went on with my testimony and whatever it was. And... Uh, I walked out, and here comes this little guy. I never met him. I knew who he was. He was madder than I'll get out. And, and if you guys can imagine, those of you who know him, he is doing everything to get in my face, and all five foot tall of Tommy Rukavina and six foot two of me, it wasn't working very well, but he was trying really hard. <laughs> and finally I said, Representative Rukavina, what are you so upset about? And he said, what you said about Senator Wellstone? And I said, well, Representative, I've got this sheet of paper right here that's got the proposal. And he took it, and he read it, and he said, Really? We'll see about this. And I'll be darned if three days later, Senator Wellstone rescinded that proposal. The Wellstone family and the Rukavina family were very good friends, and they held each other in high regard. And Tommy Rukavina and I were uh, friends to this and. Uh, there's a tremendous hole in the range that's not going to be filled. Thank you. Representative Davids. In 1998, the Republicans took the House majority. So in 1999, we went through the transition as we did here on Tuesday, only just the opposite. And the day of the swearing in, the first day of session, the headlines of the Star Tribune said 2,400 workers laid off at LTV Steel. Now, I'm the new chairman of the Commerce Committee, and Speaker Swigum uh, took seven committees, rolled them into one, called it a Commerce and Regulated Industry. So we, if you wrote a check for it, we oversaw it. And so I went to Mr. Rukavina, Representative Rukavina, and I said, Tommy, what do we do here? And he said, we need to go up to the union hall, and we need to go to the steel companies, and we need to talk to them. And so we got David Tomasoni, who was in the house that time, uh, Representative Rukavina and myself drove up to Virginia. Now, if you can imagine three hours in a car with Representative Rukavina uh, and David Tomasoni, <laughs> you just don't know what a good time is because we had a wonderful time. And we met at the union hall with the union employees, uh, and we met uh, with the steel companies, uh, and we put a deal together that quickly went through the Commerce Committee, because at that time, labor was within the Commerce Committee. And what we did was we extended unemployment benefits, and we put funding uh, into the schools, uh, or the uh, universities, or the two-year schools, uh, trade schools up there at the time, uh, to retrain workers uh, for other employment. Uh, so that's what we did, but you really get to know somebody when they take you to their mother's house. 
went to see Mrs. Rukavina, uh, and she, uh, if you know where she lived, she has a, had a place up there, and the front window looked right over a big open pit mine. And then I'm one of the few legislators on this floor that had the honor of going to Tom's house, or excuse me, Representative Rukavina's house. I have seen where Sparky lived. <laughs> and I have seen where Sparky perished. Uh, and I could get into a whole lot of stories uh, on my good friend, the Florida Bates. One of my favorites was, uh, we were doing the tax bill. I've got a couple of favorites on the tax bill. He sat down there. I sat back there by Chair Murphy. And he gets up, he always had a suit coat on, he had a lapel, and he pulled this out. He says, well, Representative Davids, I've got the incomes of the highest 10 paid Minnesotans. And I said, well, what number was I? And 11, he said, so that's the way it goes. So he said, they average $3 million a year. What do you think about that? And I'd say, well, I'd say they had a real good year, and I hope they do better next year, because we're going to tax the tar out of them. And, but it was, just, it was just the back and forth uh, with Rep. Sam Rukavina. Another one was, uh, as tax chair, he wanted something in the bill that didn't get in, and he said, Rep. Sam Davids, if I ever need a heart transplant, I'm going to ask for yours because it's never been used. <laughs> and I said, well, to my good friend from the Iron Range from Virginia, my good friend, Rep. Sam Rukavina, I said, if I ever need a brain transplant, I'm going to ask for use because I know that's never been used. <laughs> so then we went out to Mancini's and had a, had a good meal together. I mean, you could get into the uh, .08 speeches, the Made in America speeches. The first thing I looked at when I got my button was, where was this made? You notice, Laura, Air Representative Halverson is made in the United States of America. We lost a good friend. We lost a great Minnesotan for a couple reasons I say that. Because Tommy Rukavina cared about people. And what else do you need to say? Uh, Representative Rukavina is a good friend of mine. May God, uh, God bless his life and may God rest his soul. Representative Sandstead. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. So the words that we say on the House floor carry such a, a great deal of weight. And yesterday when I was asked if I wanted to speak on Tommy's behalf or to say a few words, I don't know if I've ever felt more of a challenge in the words that are gonna come out of my mouth today. I hope I do justice. I got to know Tommy Rukavina as um, an Iron Ranger, not as a legislator myself, but as one who lived on the range. Representative Rukavina represented my neighboring district, but as far as I was concerned, he represented me. He represented the Iron Range through and through, and he was a fierce advocate of the Iron Range, and I benefited from the work he and so many others have done. If you knew Tommy, you knew that he was a tremendous advocate, not only for the range, but I grew to admire him because he was a fierce advocate for teachers, for the education profession, and mostly for our students. And I will be indebted to him forever for that. Tommy, as you knew him too probably, was a phenomenal storyteller, probably the consummate storyteller and a historian and funny really funny. Um, and, and another thing about Representative Rukavina, he truly was a friend to all, whether you agreed with him or not. He would, he would argue fiercely with you over something, but at the end of the day, he'd go off and have a cup of coffee with you or shake hands or you, you left knowing that you were okay. I think we all had just such a tremendous model in Representative Rukavina. He truly was a servant leader he truly, truly was. Even after he left this house, this body, you could find him on the range continuing to serve. This past fall, I had the great privilege of having a cup of coffee with him. Representative Hornstein came to visit the range, and he didn't drive. So Representative Rukavina said, I'll pick him up. And he drove him across the Iron Range. Even as sick as he was, he took Representative Hornstein to my house 
The three of us enjoyed a, cof a cup of coffee for a very long time, and the two of us enjoyed many, many, many hysterical Rukavina stories. Tremendous, tremendous privilege. So I'm going to say without a doubt, there is a hole in the heart of this side of the dog pen. There is truly a hole in the heart of the range. And in his hospital bed, Tommy wrote a letter. And I think these are such profound words that I want to leave you with. He said, hate helps no one. Love solves all things. So as we begin our work in this session, I would like to challenge you to remember those words. They would serve us all very well. Representative Erickson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, certainly knowing uh, Representative Tommy Brucavina was an honor for me. Uh, I first met him when I was first elected in my special in 98. And, uh, we immediately began a relationship because I came to this body, as you all know, confronting the DNR, the MPCA, and any regulatory body in this agency of our uh, great state of, of Minnesota that would, uh, would shun freedom or put some kind of uh, uh, limitation on people. And Representative Rukavina was a lover of freedom. So uh, we took on the fish issues, we took on the wolf issues, uh, we took on any issue you can think of uh, in regard to the DNR. Logging was another one. And he and I would banter back and forth privately. But the bantering that I really loved that went on on this House floor, because Tommy brought levity to our serious discussions, because he was so authentic and honest, was between then Majority Leader Tim Pawlenty and Tommy Rukavina. And they would pick sayings from the 70s and go back and forth with these. And, and one would try to top the other. And I know the desk can appreciate this because they remember some of those moments. I think he used Sparky when he needed empathy from us. And I think Representative Davids would agree that when the stories were told about Sparky, it was because we needed to feel for Representative Rukavina. Because he was in the minority for a few years, starting in, in the 99 session and, and ending uh, after the 2006 election. Uh, but, but you couldn't find anyone. I mean, liking a Republican woman like me was a great honor because I have a lot of views that are different from, uh, from my uh, colleagues on the other side of the aisle. But uh, there was a, a definitely a, a, a great uh, deal of talk between us. He even co-authored in 2006, I believe it was, my video lottery bill to be used in bars that had charitable gambling. That's how, how much we could relate when it came to, this is good for rural Minnesota, because that's where our hearts were. So it is with, uh, with uh, a great deal of respect that I remember Representative Rukavina. I ask uh, the Lord to bless his memory and to, uh, to even bless the fact that at one point, Representative Rukavina came on this floor when Tim Pawlenty was our governor and claimed that he had put him in a stranglehold because he needed to make a point. Because Tommy was on that day very upset about some decision that the governor had made, and he had to make his point. And it was just what we needed in this chamber at the time was for Representative Rukavina to make this this image of, of stranglehold because of his true feelings. So uh, again, I ask the Lord to bless his memory and to be with his family as they grieve and for us to remember someone who was just a, a, a great legislator and uh, so much fun for me to know and uh, I will miss him dearly. Representative Pulowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I'm going to start with a description of the painting that's in front of us of Abraham Lincoln. The painting is a copy of a copy from the original painting by George Healy called The, Pace, the Peacemakers. And I do that because Representative Rukavina loved any historical anecdote about the house. He treasured them. But then why is the painting there? The painting's there because he is a bona fide political genius. 
Abraham Lincoln. Over the last few sessions, I've heard the word genius used for members and staff. I've heard the term rock star used for certain individuals. I even heard the term goddess used once. In my 32 years, I couldn't apply any of those terms to anyone in this body with one exception. And even the word goddess, because once Tom Rukavina stood up and said he looked pretty good in a dress. <laughs> so, if Lincoln is a political genius, how does that relate to Tom Rukavina? And it relates to Tom Rukavina because Lincoln had a trait that Tom Rukavina had, and that is bringing people together, and almost always through humor. Lincoln could tell a joke or a story while they were in the telegraph office of the War Department waiting for the latest casualty figures of whatever campaign there was during the Civil War. And at times, Secretary of War Stanton would get so upset with Lincoln, he'd storm out screaming, which only generated another story by Lincoln. Tom Rukavina is famous for his stories, which by the way, I do have to make a correction about at least one of them. Perhaps his most famous story deals with Christmas Eve, two children, a pack of timber wolves, and the family dog. Now how could anyone put those things together and have us in stitches for about 15 minutes. And by the way, the buttons that were passed out the next day had a picture of the dog, and his name was Spunky, not Sparky. Spunky. Let's get that right or he'd be popping up now. I'm not gonna tell the story. It's on my Facebook page. It's from my journal. The whole story of what he did. But my parents lived in Red Wing. So I would drive through Red Wing going both ways. And I'd stop coming up and going back. The night he told that story, I stopped. My father was still crying from laughing so hard at the story. And he was in the middle of drafting a letter to Rukavina. He's wiping tears from his eyes. That was the first of what would be hundreds of letters between Rukavina and my father. Now, he was a man of letters. Rukavina was a man of letters, as has already been alluded to. And I found out just how extensive. When Rukavina left, a file appeared on my desk, about four inches thick. Gene Pulowski Sr. letters. One letter was pulled out of the file with another note, my favorite. And it deals with my father's letter to Rukavina when Rukavina was running for one of our august positions. And he had called my father and said, I need Representative Pulowski's vote. So on my way home, I had a half hour of why to vote for, for Representative Rukavina. On the way back, I had another half hour of why to vote for Representative Rukavina. And the letter, which was tattered, highlighted, because Tommy carried around, had my father's observations while he watched the vote. He said, here I am watching the vote on the House floor on my TV, and my son votes for the wrong candidate. But of course, he always took after his mother. <laughs> Tommy would carry that around, and he'd pull it out. So anytime he wanted my vote, he'd pull the letter out, he'd read it, and then he'd say, I hope this time Representative Rukavina, or Representative Pulowski takes after his father. <laughs> so I'm gonna end with the painting where I start. It was four o'clock in the morning. The house had been in a 24-hour binger. We were all grumpy. Tommy stands up and he starts to spin one of his tails. Within five minutes, the whole mood had changed. I looked up at that painting, and I swore I saw Lincoln slap his knee, his head went back, and he started laughing with us. 
And that I took as recognition of one political genius to Minnesota's political genius. Bob Gunther. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I have quite a few stories from, about Tommy, too, but the one I think of the most was the time that I saw a crowd around Tommy, and they were basically freshman Republicans, and he was addressing the crowd like only Tommy can, and he was saying, I want you to know that very often I have to give a Republican $100 so they can go file to run against me so I can get the state money and the party money so I can have some money for my campaign. <laughs> and uh, I said, Tommy, just out of curiosity, how, what percentage do you get? He says, oh, about 80. I said, well, that's pretty good. You know, and at that time I had two times I didn't have an opponent in a row. So I had 99 and 99 and 73 and 73, added them up, I got more than 80%. I says, what's the matter, Tommy? Don't people like you up there? <laughs> the other one is one time we were talking about somebody that raped and killed someone. And uh, now Congressman Emmer came up with a new way of taking care of it. It was called chemical castration. And naturally, Tommy couldn't let that get by. So he jumped up on the other side. I could hear him, see him just barely. But anyway, he says, Emmer, I got a new nickname for you. And Tom says, what's that? Snips? <laughs> Tom was a great friend, and I will remember him as long as I live. Representative Hornstein. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. You know, they say that if uh, uh, Tom Rukavina likes you, he's really going to yell at you. And I'll never forget about 10 years ago in the retiring room, uh, we really got into it about uh, the primary seatbelt bill. And uh, he ripped me up uh, through and through, and um, I knew we had a good friendship. But actually, that friendship began 27 years ago. Uh, I was not in the legislature at that time. I was advocating for a particular environmental bill, yes, an environmental bill. And I went to uh, the chairman of the Environment Committee, Willard Munger, at the time. And uh, as a good committee chair, he said, I like your idea, but you should have someone else on the committee do it. Why don't you uh, have Tom Rukavina sponsor your bill? So I knock on his door, and I did, I'd never met him before, and this short, friendly, gregarious guy ushers me in, I see his Bruce Springsteen poster, and I knew that we were going to be friends. Uh, and he advocated for that bill. We, we didn't get it passed, but he was there every step of the way with his passion and his humor and his insight. And then I was elected in 2002, and it was the, the few uh, days after uh, Paul Wellstone's uh, plane went down. And I uh, knocked on Tommy's door again because you know, when you're a freshman, you don't know a lot of people, and you want to sort of uh, check in with the few people that you know here. And uh, he was one of them, and we uh, had many long conversations in his office about Paul Wellstone and their friendship and their relationship. And, you know, Paul and Tom shared so much together. They were short in stature, but big in impact. Their economic populism, their humor. And, uh, you know, Paul was a giant in Minnesota politics, as was Tom, and I just don't think there's going to be another Paul or another Tom. Uh, they were that unique, that special, and, and I think that that legacy of Paul Wellstone uh, really lived in Tom Rukavina. But what I want to end with is that uh, one thing that hasn't uh, often been discussed is I've read the wonderful uh, tributes to Tom uh, on Facebook and in the media over the last few days is that he had this incredible love and respect for immigrants and immigrant traditions and immigrant families, whether they were from the Iron Range or, or native. He valued those family stories. And earlier this year, uh, I called him up and we had a long conversation where he told me the story of every Jewish Iron Range business. <laughs> there was Ostrov's grocery store and on and on. And I said to, to Tom, wouldn't it be interesting if we, these are incredible stories and, and the Jewish community in the Twin Cities should know them. Wouldn't it be great if we got a, a group of folks from our synagogue up to the Iron Range and learn some of this history that you're telling me about? And he said, that's a great idea. 
And so one of the reasons I went up, uh, Representative Sansett had mentioned this uh, trip I took in August. I wanted to see Tom, and I wanted to talk more about this idea. And, uh, you know, we toured uh, a restored synagogue in Virginia. Now, Tom helped get the money for that. And so this beautiful 1920s era synagogue on the first floor, and on the, in the basement is a, a historical society, Iron Range Historical Society, exhibit about the Serbo-Croatian immigrants on the range. That's really, you know, what Tommy was about. And, you know, if you were part Croat, then you were automatically his friend. And I remember uh, uh, when Congressman Ellison and I were sitting in the back row, one time uh, uh, Congressman Ellison was, at that time Representative Ellison was uh, telling Tommy, you know, somewhere in my family tree, I, I think I have some Croatian. And uh, Representative Rukumina just greer, grinned ear to ear, and he just loved that. And if you had any range connections in your family, uh, you know, didn't matter, Democrat or Republican, you were his friend. And so um, at that uh, uh, last um, uh, time I saw Tom, we, I went to his home, and he has this beautiful, beautiful plot of land off of 169, and it's, it's a home he built. He had so much passion, you know, for that, that place that he would, that was his retreat, that was his space, and he worked on it and worked on it. Uh, and rehabbed it many times, and you see there's this big picture window with the forest and this wonderful vegetable garden, and then off to the side is a shed, and in the shed there's uh, uh, campaign signs for so many of his favorite Iron Range uh, legislators and, uh, and, and the Democrats who he worked so hard for. There's a very prominent one for uh, Congressman Oberstar, as I recall. And so um, I want to honor the way that Tom honored people in terms of, you know, who he respected so much the working man and woman, and that's really, at the end of the day, who he, who he represented. And he loved, again, every, he just, his respect for people's backgrounds and their families and their stories and their, their immigrant traditions. So I want to just say, in my own tradition, in, in Hebrew, Livracha Bracha. May his name be for a blessing. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My father and Representative Rukavina served together in the 80s and were great dear friends. Matter of fact, my father uh, would say that uh, Rukavina is his best friend on that side of the aisle. And they shared a lot in common. The desk will know that, the two of them, when they did get up and speak. Uh, so Dad would always share a lot of stories about Rukavina. When I was a young boy, I got the chance to meet him, and when I came in through this house floor, uh, one of the first persons that my father introduced me was to Tommy Rukavina. He says, Joe, I want to introduce you to my favorite Democrat, one of my favorite friends here. He's almost as good as I am, and he's certainly not taller, though. So I looked up to him, I says, well, gee, Dad, he says, am I going to grow that tall someday? And my dad puts his hand on my shoulder, and he says, I hope not, son. So then, fast forward many years, I have the opportunity, the honor, to be elected and to serve with Tom Rukavina. We both were on this side of the dog pound. I'm sure you folks can't see me, much like I couldn't see him when he spoke, and that's okay. But for the record, I am taller. <laughs> well, anyway, the first two years, we were in the majority, so I didn't speak much. I'm Irish, so I don't talk a lot. My second term, my second term, we were in the minority and you tend to speak a little bit more in the minority. Finally, after the first week in the minority, Rukavina came up to me, he says, you know, Joe, or actually Little KJ, he called me Little KJ, he was always Little KJ. He said, Little KJ, I tell you what, I always wondered what KJ meant, what his initials were, and I finally found out. He says, stand for knee jerk, because every time I spoke, he had a knee jerk reaction, and up he went to dispute something that I had to say. <laughs> he said, you're just like him, so I'm calling you Little KJ. So anyway, uh, Tom's greatest gift, I think, indeed, was storytelling, but the fact that he truly loved people. And he never took himself too seriously, could take a good joke, especially if it was at him, a short joke. That's not free reign for all you folks, especially Representative Nash. But he loved the gift of humor and the gift of people and the gift of nature. And that's something that we should all learn. We're going to get some heated debates. And some things we say you won't like and some things you say we won't like. But at the end of the day, we must learn from Rukavina and from my father as well, 
It's never personal, and it's always a love for one another. And uh, that is his greatest gift, because he certainly was a lot of fun. I didn't know he was going to retire. And uh, I think that many of us who didn't know, some of you probably did, it was a shock and a disappointment, too. I remember being disappointed that I won't have the opportunity to say goodbye or to uh, tell him what an honor it was to serve with him. He came to our caucus meeting, I think it was about two years ago, and when he came into our caucus office room, he got a standing ovation. There were smiles on every one of us caucus members, you remember that? We were so delighted to see our dear friend, Tommy Rukavina, because he brought, brought such joy and happiness to our lives. And we can only hope that we could live up to that reputation to do so. So uh, God bless Tommy Rukavina and his great family, and thanks for bringing joy, humor, and life to our family. Representative Hansen. I sat next to Tom Rukavina for eight years. Um, right here. I saw him when he was happy. I saw him when he was hurt. I saw him when he was tired. I saw him when he was energetic. I also saw the tremendous feeling and belief that he had in the people of Minnesota. And he kept, as Representative Pulowski mentioned, he kept everything in his pocket. All those speeches that he gave, you may think he had written them out. I got to see those speeches. He would usually take that out of his pocket. He would put it down here and he'd tap for me to hold on to one end of it. <laughs> and it was usually about three or four scrawlings that I couldn't read. It was usually just a bullet point. And he would hit every bullet point. He would hit every bullet point because it was all in here and more importantly, it was in here. Tom would sit here and he would take calls during the floor from everybody. People were calling him, and as technology improved, he'd show me things and he'd show me messages, and he was so proud when he could solve a problem for somebody. It didn't matter where it was from. Tom would come here and he would be very deliberate when he was the only one who was going to vote for or against something. Now, sometimes Tom disappeared, and Mr. Charbonneau would come here, and he'd point to his desk, and he'd look, and I'd go, I don't, I don't know where he is. Um, sometimes he would tell me, Tom would tell me, I, this is a confession, I sometimes voted for Tom, um, and he would say, <laughs> vote me with the liberals. And sometimes he would say, Vote me with the Libertarians. Vote me with Draz. And then sometimes he'd look at me and he'd have this deadpan and he'd said, say, vote me the opposite of you. <laughs> he was a genius, uh, Representative Pulowski. He had a sharp grasp of history. And he would talk about history. He would talk about that history. So I think of him now. Floyd, Olson was one, Floyd B. Olson was one of his heroes. He's probably debating Floyd B. Olson. He'd tell me about Gus Hall and the Red Fins. He's probably debating them. Talking with Hubert Humphrey and chatting with Paul and Sheila. That's how I think of Tom. Representative Hurtas. Well, thank you. And I had the uh, great opportunity to meet Tommy a couple of times before I joined the legislature, but I really wanted to segue on uh, one of the stories, and uh, it really kind of picks up where Representative McDonald left off, and for the benefit of at least 35 or 40 members who uh, could understand how this man could light up the room, how he could. Uh, really embellish in his storytelling, and he just loved to do that. And as Representative Donald mentioned, uh, it, it was a few years ago that uh, he came blasting into our caucus, and he said, uh, I got to come over here where there's some san sanity. Uh, you know, the other side of the aisle over there, you know, the other caucus room is just crazy right now. And uh, we started laughing, and of course the whole room lit up, and he said, this wolf issue, he said, you, you got to 
you know, it's come off the endangered species list. You, you got to do something about the wolves. There's just too many of them up north. And everybody's kind of looking, where is he going with this? And he said, you know, a bunch of constituents came to me and said, you know, you can't let them take that off the list. You, you can't have hunting of wolves. And Tommy said, well, you know, there's too many wolves. And you may not know this, but they ate my dog. <laughs> and all of us just kind of, oh. You know, looked at it, and I, certainly some of us that were newer, but he said, what I didn't tell him is the dog had already died, and it was winter, <laughs> and I couldn't bury it, and it was out on the back wood pile, but the wolves did eat the dog. <laughs> so with that, it gives you a little bit of the character of, of the type of stories that he loved to tell, and uh, we're all going to miss him, and uh, like many of us, uh, myself included, had no idea that he was even ill, and um, my prayers go out to his family. Thank you. Representative Bush. So I, I didn't, clearly didn't read my email. I didn't even know we were going to do this uh, today. Uh, and when I found out we were going to do it, I found uh, a lot of emotions welling back uh, about my time with Tommy. And I apologize to those of you who came around to ask me to sign a bill or do something, and I snapped at you, uh, four or five of you. It's because uh, when we start talking about Tommy and I recall um, how good of a friend he always was, and I didn't reciprocate. You know, he, everyone gets too busy with stuff, right? He calls me uh, periodically. I call him back one time for every three or four times he calls. Um, but I remember when I was a freshman, and one of the first things I remember wasn't specifically something that Tommy said to me, but it gave me an impression of what kind of guy Tommy was. I ran into John Dorn, okay, who... who uh, had the seat that I think Jack Considine has now, or roughly thereabouts, uh, and Gene Polowski in the SOB. And I was a freshman, and they said to me, uh, okay, if you're ever here late at night and you hear some noises, once in a while, uh, Tom Rukavina and Mike Charbonneau chase each other up and down the hallways in Batman and Robin costumes. <laughs> and he said it deadpan, just like that, and I'm a freshman, you know, so I don't know what he's talking about. I don't know what Tom is about, but... Uh, as the years went on, that got funnier and funnier. Now, Tom uh, was a, uh, a very good friend to me, as he was a very good friend to a lot of people, but especially to me during a time that was uh, the toughest part of my life uh, in the wake of a breakup of a relationship. And uh, during those times, any of you who's gone through stuff like that know that uh, your better judgment or the angel whispering in your, uh, your right ear um, goes away for a little while, and I did something I'd always wanted to do, but which uh, better judgment had cautioned me against, which was uh, I went to Iraq, uh, and I traveled there, and it still remains the best trip of my life, but uh, the better judgment that I had most other times would have cautioned me against that. At that time, it was gone. So uh, Tommy knew I was going through a particularly rough time. He was one of the only people who really knew uh, what I was going through at the time, and so when I showed up in Baghdad, I had had my, uh, my money wired ahead to a secure source. Uh, and so I showed up, I only had a little bit of money with me and found out I had to get through. I walk outside after I finally got through. I almost got deported, by the way, and avoided that. Uh, but I got through to these Blackwater guys, these security personnel who are outside. And there's one guy sitting uh, with his arms folded across with this mamba. It's a uh, uh, ironclad South African transport vehicle and Blackwater travels in three vehicle transports at the time. The guy was sitting up front. He said, who are you? And I mumbled some business about, you know, I'm here on other business. And he said, no, where are you from? And I said, the United States. He said, I know um, what state. And I said, Minnesota. And he said, I knew it. I could tell by the accent. Uh, and he said to me, do you know Tom Rukavina? <laughs> and I'm sitting there, I'm in the middle of Baghdad. There's a war going on. I already heard uh, explosions going off, a couple of them. Um, they could have been for training. They could have been legitimate. I don't know. But I thought, this is weird. A guy asked me if I know Tom Rukavina. And I said, actually, yeah, I do. Now, I didn't tell him I was in the legislature. Um, but he's asking me, how well I know Tom Rukavina. So we get to this spot, and I need to get transport from the airport uh, to the IZ, the green zone in Baghdad, which at the time was called Route Irish. It was the most dangerous road in the world. And uh, I had to find a way to get there. Well, 
I made them a little bit nervous because they thought I was a reporter. Blackwater was not a fan of having reporters travel with them, as you'd find out later uh, after some business that went down with Blackwater and Fallujah. Um, but they put me up in a cab. So I actually took a cab down Route Irish. And as I said, I didn't necessarily have the cash. It was $100 U.S. to get there. So he says, uh, uh, well, okay, the guy, the Blackwater guy says to me, you know, I tell you what, I can spot you the 100 bucks. But what he didn't tell me is that he called home to check me out, to find out if I was legit. He called his dad, who was a, a union rep with teachers in Hibbing, and says, hey, I got this guy here, John Lesh. Uh, he says he knows Tom Rukavina. Can you call Tom and find him if I'm going to get my 100 bucks back? <laughs> so his dad calls Tom, Tommy, and this is how the story went down. He says, uh, his dad calls Tommy and says, hey, Tommy, uh, my son uh, is loaning John Lesh 100 bucks. Uh, he's trying to get a cab ride in Baghdad. And Tommy said to him, yeah, he's good for the 100 bucks, but what the hell is he doing in Baghdad? I didn't, I didn't tell Tommy I was necessarily going. Um, and so after that, I heard all the stories um, about what was going on back here that I wasn't necessarily paying attention to in the, in the press. Uh, but Tommy always took care of you. And, and Tommy took care of me when I was back, too. And in fact, I posted this video. I think I ran out of gas three times in my adult life. And two of them, Tommy bailed me out. Uh, and he made sure to remind me of that in a video I took of him at the uh, convention when he was running for governor. I bailed you out. You know, I'll bail Minnesota out. But the deal about Tommy was we all, most of us, have a public persona and a private persona. And it's sort of required to a certain extent around here. Uh, the things that you're thinking, the internal voice, you know, like Tommy, most people don't say out loud because no matter what party you're in or no matter what part of the state you come from or no matter the interest group with which you are identified, you have thoughts that don't necessarily toe the party line, which means you have a public persona and a private persona. Tommy didn't have that. There was no daylight between private Tommy and public Tommy. And so when we're standing here talking about how we all love Tommy Riccovina and now that he's gone and maybe we should have talked to him more or interacted with him more when he was alive, we don't do this for the freshmen. We won't really do this. I mean, the speaker announces, hey, I'm sorry, by the way, a former member died. Okay, we don't remember them like this. Republicans don't remember Democrats like this and vice versa. But the reason we all love Tommy is because there was no daylight between private Tommy and public Tommy. You knew what you were getting. There was no line that he was giving you. And I think maybe the legislature would be a little bit better. More of us would be remembered the way Tommy is if we reduce that separation between our public self and our private self, because every single person in Minnesota knew that Tommy was out there to take care of them. Unless, of course, you were a rich guy. Uh, but he still loved you, Representative Chair Davids. <laughs> Representative Scott. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. And my, my story is very short. Um, but uh, in 2011 is when we took the majority over, um, and I had the privilege of moving into Tommy's old office on 477. And um, I was putting things away, and I opened the credenza, and there was a big bottle of an adult beverage that Tommy... I'm sure, didn't know he left behind. And um, so I, I questioned him about it later. I said, Tommy, do you want to come up to your office? You left something there. And he says, well, what is it? And I told him. And he says, well, did you drink it? <laughs> and I said, well, no, I didn't, but you can still come up and get it. But in all seriousness, Tommy is everything that everybody has said here today. And um, those of you that didn't know him, you missed out on just a real... Um, just uh, a bright person, a, a, just a real, um, his, his um, persona was so contagious and he always made you feel um, positive. He always had something positive to say about me and, and to me and um, just really will miss the guy. And um, thanks for doing this today. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, members, I can remember standing on the House floor a few years ago during some sort of a debate, I can't tell you what it was, and I made the comment to the chamber, I said, 
I realize I will never be as eloquent as my good, Zen, good friend, Representative Anzel, nor will I ever be as charming as my good friend, Representative Rukavina. Now, some people probably don't think of Tommy as being charming, but I, I did. Um, Tommy was one of those guys that everybody loved to be around, whether you were a political ally of his or an enemy. And he had what I refer to as it. There was just a whole bunch of stuff packed into a relatively small package uh, that just made him someone that we liked to be around. And I'm going to just share two things real quickly, and I know we're kind of getting um, beyond our timeline here. Um, Representative David, you talked about spending three hours in a car with Tommy. Well, Tommy called me Danny. Okay, there's only about three people in my life that ever called me Danny. My Aunt Leona, my college track coach for some reason, and Tommy. And I took it as a term of endearment. Um, three hours, one of my very first exposures to Tom, I'm a freshman carrying House File 1, walking in from the parking ramp, and Tom and I get on the elevator together. And I seriously don't remember which floor he was on, but I know I was on the fourth floor. So I don't remember if he got off the elevator first or if I did. We were the only two people in the elevator. The door closes, and all of a sudden, it's this eruption. Phoebean, he says. What the blankety blank, blank, blank is up with you? You're a school teacher. You're a Republican. And rah, 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 he goes after me again like that. The door opens, and I don't remember if I stepped off or if he stepped off, and he says, have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> and from that moment on, I loved him. Um, I also want to say one other thing. On November, I believe it was November 15th, we were here for Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council. And we found out that Tom was at the University of Minnesota Hospital. So former representative Denny McNamara, myself, and Dave Tomasoni decided to meet and go up to the hospital to see Tommy. Well, when we got there, we had to get all gowned up, and we had to put on the masks and everything. So McNamara and I got there first. And we put on all of our stuff, and we come walking into the room. And here's Tommy, just laying on the bed, just pretty casual. And about five minutes later, Tomasoni comes in. And hasn't gowned up, doesn't have a mask on, and, and Tommy says to him, are you trying to kill me? <laughs> so anyway, Tom got started talking about, and this is what, this kind of captures Tommy for me, his optimism. He was excited about his upcoming treatment, which was a bone marrow transplant. And we got started talking about that and how serious this is. But he was optimistic and excited about it. Why? Because the donor of his bone marrow, he told us, was a six foot six inch German. <laughs> he thought there was still hope. <laughs> Tommy, there is still hope for us. God bless you. Representative Quam. Well, when I got to the legislature, I uh, told people I'd overcome my bashfulness, my shyness, my reservedness, um, and I was, was joking. But around Tommy, I discovered there's a whole new level to uh, not being uh, shy or embarrassed about who you are. And it was refreshing in the political world to see that. Uh, most of the stories, I guess I would blush and have difficulty saying on the floor that I really liked, but almost all of them had that little glint in the eye, that, that turn to the head, and you knew Tommy was off, and it, it made the tough times here bearable and enjoyable, and he was always quick. I remember one time he had talked, I think, Matt Dean and him had gone back and forth and saw him in the retiring room. I said, Tommy, I just can't, I couldn't see you. I could hear you over there. Uh, my, my, I got my grandson's uh, booster seat in the car. And, and he looked and he said, no, give it to McDonald first. <laughs> and, and he always, no matter what you had, 
He always was snapping quick. But I think his heart showed most in a memory. I saw him and Bach in an energetic discussion. Um, and those of you that, that know the two uh, realize that happened from time to time. And, and it reminded me of that loyal little dog and a grizzly bear that you see, you know, pictures of. And it was that heart and that spirit and that honesty that made that individual connect with whoever you were. And, and Tommy, you, you've asked me that question and others. I don't know if they're American, but they were made in Duluth. Representative Mahoney. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I really can't tell too many funny stories about Tom because it hit me. I served all the time when Tom was here on the jobs committee with him. And Tom always had a quip. We all have heard them. Something funny, but there was a moral piece to it. And we've all spoken about Tom's core and how it touched many of us. And every time he had something to say, if you listened, there was a moral piece to it, how to be a better human, how to treat your fellow man human, men and women uh, better, how to protect the poor, how to protect those less fortunate than us. He taught me how to be a good committee chair. I watched him rip people up and down one side the other. And then he'd explain to me afterwards what was going on and what it meant and how he'd go around and find that person a little later and try and help him with a bill, whether it was a Republican or Democrat. I'm going to miss Tom. Just the fact that he's on this earth was comforting to me. And to those that knew him, I hope they had that same feeling. And we'll miss him greatly. And treat each other as best as you can in a Tom Rukabina way. Because he was, he had a core that many of us only wish for. We think we have it. We hope we have it. Tom had it. And wherever he is right now, I hope he's looking down on this, going, I don't deserve that. I was just being me. All the things that we would expect Tom to say. I, I will tell the one thing that impressed me, and it was funny. But those of you who remember uh, Oscop, you know, six foot five, whatever, 300 pounds or better, and Tommy going at it each, at, I thought they were literally going to come to blows. And they both got up when it was done, and they walked in, and you could see steam coming out of their ears. Both of them headed to the balcony where we used to smoke and went out there and had a cigarette together, and were laughing. That's what we should all do. And we should all help the members that we can and humankind that we can and out of respect for Tom. We can't do it like he did, but we can do it once or twice, and we'll honor his, his memory. Representative Franson. So when I was elected in 2011, I didn't think I had any personal connections to the legislature. Um, and one day I was having a conversation with, with Representative Rukavina in the retiring room. And he was wondering where I grew up and where I, I told him I grew up in Saginaw and um, got to chatting. He asked who my family was and 
he found out that my grandfather was Peter Benzoni. And he said, your grandfather is Peter Benzoni? And I said, well, yes. He goes, I went to your grandfather for my very first job. You are a Republican. You should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> my grandfather was head of the Steelworkers Union in the area, and uh, he got off the bench in the retiring room, and he took my arm, and he drug me to the other side of the aisle. Now, I hadn't had much conversations with my friends on the other side of the aisle at that point. Uh, Tommy Rukavina opened up those doors, though. So the first person he took me to, if I recall correctly, was, um, was Representative Anzels. You would never believe whose granddaughter this is. And Representative Anzell says, who? This is Peter Benzoni's granddaughter. And, and uh, Representative Anzell was just shocked. What are you doing over there? He said. Your grandfather was a Democrat, a very good Democrat. And then uh, eventually I made my way to Representative Murphy, Mary Murphy there, who has a a uh, wonderful relationship with my grandfather, too, who's, who's been passed for many years. Um, but to have those stories that Tommy would say about my grandfather every so often, he would tell me another one, and just those connections and you know, um, to my grandfather and uh, stories that I had never, ever heard before. And, um, and Representative Mary Murphy does the same for me, too, every so often, so thank you. And... Um, you know, that when he came into the caucus, he had to remind me again that my grandfather was rolling in his grave for being a Republican, but all in, all in good fun. Um, so, yes, his voice certainly will be missed. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, I wasn't going to say anything, uh, but I felt like I couldn't not say something about Tommy Rukabina. He was um, a pretty special guy, I think, to everybody in the chamber, and I literally felt like he was, I was his best friend here. Um, and it, it dawned, of course I wasn't, uh, but it dawned on me that I think that's what made him special. Everybody here felt like they were his best friend. Um, and I would love to share a bunch of stories with you about him, uh, but I think I have the same problem that many of you do. Those stories aren't appropriate for this chamber. Um, and I think that was another thing that was pretty special about Tommy Rukabina. If you ask me in the retiring room later, I'll share a few of them with you. Um, uh, he was, for us Republicans, uh, and I remember as a freshman, um, I sat over here in what we call the dog pound underneath the scoreboard, and uh, he sat directly across on the other side, and because of the front desk, you can't really see each other very well, um, and of course, we always mocked him that it was because of his height, and I remember as we would debate back and forth, I would tell him, you know, as I'm up on my tippy toes trying to see him, I would say, stand up on your chair, Tommy, so we can see you over here. Um, and of course, we always mocked him about his height, uh, but he was fun, and as, as Republicans, we really uh, loved him because he mastered the, the political tactics of, of making the range delegation super important um, and strategic because he would get the range delegation to vote in a block, and when he wanted to get something passed in a bill when we were in the majority, he would vote with us uh, and, and, and vice versa. And, and uh, if there was enough range members, and if, it was, if that number was greater than the difference between the majority and the minority, um, they could really impact legislation here. And, and he really did master that. And I think the, the, the rangers that are here uh, have big shoes to fill. Um, he was a really great guy and a, a really great uh, legislator and, and somebody who um, I, I think the range wouldn't be what it is today had Tommy Rukavina not served in this chamber and, and really mastered... Um, how to be an effective legislator and how to bring things to the range. And I don't know if anybody said it yet, but um, the, the joke about uh, our state motto actually standing for send the money north. And the number of times that I heard Tommy Rukavina say that on the House floor, um, that's what I remember about Tommy Rukavina. And I'll tell you, uh, there has been a hole in this chamber since Tommy Rukavina left. And I think since he passed, uh, there will be forever a hole uh, in the range. Representative Winkler. Members, we're going to close with the current holder of the Rukavina seat in the Minnesota House, Representative Liss Lagarde. Uh, and I uh, 
I have little to add to what has already been said, except to summarize that Tom Rukavina was larger than life. He was a giant of the Minnesota House. He was a giant of the Minnesota legislature. And the reason was because he had the biggest heart of anyone here. Uh, just for your information, uh, funeral arrangements for Tom are next Saturday, January 19th at 11 a.m. at the Holy Spirit Catholic Church in Virginia with visitation at the Range Funeral Home uh, Friday evening before bet between 5 and 7. Uh, so it's a Friday, Saturday, and any members, therefore, who won't have legislative business uh, would like to attend the family would welcome your presence. Um, Tom had a huge heart. He always let you know exactly where you stood, and uh, sometimes that was a good thing, sometimes that was a bad thing. And uh, Representative Hornstein is incorrect about one thing. When Tommy found out that you had an Iron Rain connection, you didn't become his friend. You became beholden to him. <laughs> and whether it was a grandfather or it was because you were a teacher and you, should be a you shouldn't be a Republican, he, whatever connection he had, he would find a way to make sure that you knew you were doing something wrong. Uh, and for me, uh, he, when he found out that uh, my grandfather owned the bar on Main Street, Virginia, and that uh, a family member had been a deputy sheriff there, uh, he, uh, from that point forward, knew that I was a ranger, even though I was from Bemidji. And um, in fact, after I was elected by our caucus to be the next majority leader, I got an email from Tom. Uh, it was from the hospital. And he said, uh, he always called me Wink. He's, and, uh, you know, putting it in his uh, accent, Wink, my advice for you is forget the suburbs. They always swing. Stick with the farmers and the loggers and the miners. We're always going to be with you. And then he signed it, uh, and that's just some advice from a nobody. <laughs> and uh, I think we all know that uh, Tom Rukavina was far from a nobody, and he was uh, maybe one of the uh, biggest personalities that ever graced this legislature. And I would like to say rest in peace but I think a more fitting thing to say for Tom Rukavina is keep giving him hell. Representative List the Guard. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, I come today with a heavy heart for my first time. Um, this isn't what I pictured. It's probably what Tommy pictured. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk about his heart. And so I was one of them laid off steel workers back in 2002 when I lost my job with a young family. And Tommy was there for me. My whole life with politics, it's always been Tom Rukavina. He was larger than life. It's said that uh, people don't care what you know until they know you care. Well, Tommy knew a lot, but he even cared more. He helped prepare me for this uh, opportunity that I'm here. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. While he was fighting for his life, just three, four weeks ago, he was trying to prepare me for this moment right here. That's how much Tommy meant to this region. I'll never be a Tommy Rukavina. Tommy's not replaceable. You can't emulate him. They say things come, some things come very special in little packages. Tommy was the tallest guy I know. He walked into the room. He was always our closer on the Iron Range. Any event, any, organi any organization that we did, we had him as our closer because nobody wanted to go up against him. To his family, Ida, Jean, I'm truly sorry for your loss. For the Iron Range, there is a hole, as Representative Sand said, said. It'll never be filled, because you can't replace a Tom Rukavina. We can only honor him. Thank you. Thank you, members. Let's take a moment of silence for our friend Tom. <laughs> 